A couple of weeks ago, I had a great privilege of going up to Lake Tahoe for a study leaf, and I went up to the Presbyterian Conference grounds at Zephyr Cove. I'm not sure if you've ever been there, but it's a, it's a beautiful place right on the, the shoreline of Lake Tahoe. Uh, I know that uh, years ago when Reverend Takarabe was the pastor here, we used to have pastor's retreats there uh, every, every year. We would have a pastor's retreat, and then we would have a, a, a retreat where all 18 Japanese Presbyterian uh, churches got together. It was a wonderful time of, of fellowship. And I went up there, and uh, really the, the theme of the, the conference was on the pastor's personal life. And there were about 12 other pastors, uh, mostly from that area up around Lake Tahoe. But one of the, uh, the presenters was, was talking about uh, who the pastor is in the pulpit. And one of the things that this pastor says, you know, oftentimes when you're speaking from the pulpit, that you're not telling the congregation anything new. But what you're doing is simply reminding them of things that they, they already know. Oftentimes as I, I, I stand up here in the pulpit, you know, I'm aware that maybe some of the things that, that I've shared are maybe things that I've shared before. And, and really that's the, the practice of the pulpit. It's just to remind the congregation of what the Word of God says on any particular topic at that time. And so as you may remember, last uh, Sunday I brought part one of a message entitled Diffusing Conflict. And this morning like to turn once again to see what the Apostle Peter has to say about diffusing conflict. So if you have your Bibles, will you turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3, and we're going to be looking at verses 8 to 11. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 to 11. Now, you may remember that one of the things that I, I mentioned at the beginning of my message last Sunday was that God is a God of diversity. God loves diversity. If you look around our sanctuary, you see that no two people look alike. No two people have exactly the same uh, hairdo. No two people are dressed the exact same way. As you look around the congregation, if we began to engage in conversation, we would find that we all have different interests. We all have different passions. We all have different talents and abilities. And because God created us differently, there are going to be times when we don't always see eye to eye. And we talked about that being true in Peter's day as well. This was something that was also taking place in the lives of the early church. And so Peter was trying to give some practical, tangible advice on how believers should live out their lives together. And one of the things that Peter says in 1 Peter 3.8, he says that the Christians should live together in harmony. Not only with those who were inside the church, but also those who were outside the church. Because that was a witness to them of the power of the gospel. As people saw Christians, as people saw them getting along with others, it was a good testimony to the life that they could share together by being in a committed relationship with Jesus Christ. And so Peter here is giving us some practical advice on how we should seek to get along with others and how we can live lives to help resolve conflict. And so let me read 1 Peter 3, 8 to 11. Finally, all of you live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic, love as brothers, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech. He must turn from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. Now, last Sunday I shared with you that there are in this passage of scripture, six attitudes or, or six virtues that Peter shares with us on how to diffuse conflict. Last Sunday, I looked at the first three of those, which were sympathy, loyalty, or brotherly love. And the third attitude that I spoke on was that of compassion. 
And so this morning, I want to continue my message by looking at the next three attitudes or virtues. And the next attitude that God wants to develop in our own lives in order to diffuse conflict is that of humility. If you look at 1 Peter 3.8, he says, be compassionate and humble. And so we are to live lives of humility. But you know, when you think about it, humility is arguably uh, the essential uh, of all encompassing virtues of the Christian life. The Apostle Paul used this form of the Greek word in Philippians 2.3 when he said, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. And then he says, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. You know, sometimes in our church service we sing that, that, that song by Wes Terasaki, uh, Matthew 11. And in Matthew 11, verse 29, Jesus said this. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle. And then Jesus says, I am humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And so the example that we have of humility really comes from our Lord Jesus himself. In fact, in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11, Paul tells us that our attitude should be exactly like the attitude that Jesus had. And he says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so when we look at the life of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Jesus led a life of humility. And when we get into conflict, we also need to seek to live a life of humility. When we get into conflict, of course, we always think that the, the other person is at fault, right? When we get into conflict, it's not my problem, it's the other person's problem. And you may say that the person you're having conflict, you may say, oh, that person, he's just so stubborn. He's self-willed. And sometimes when in you get into conflict, you can be staring each other from across the room, and you could just be thinking in your own mind, I'm not going to give in. And that's an attitude that a lot of people have. But really what that attitude is, it's an attitude of pride. And one of the things that Scripture says in 1 Corinthians 13, 4, it says, love is not proud. And we learn very quickly that every time we get into a conflict with someone, pride or stubbornness is somehow involved. In Proverbs 13.10, King Solomon writes, pride only breeds quarrels or arguments, but wisdom is found in those who take advice. So let me ask you here, if you're proud or stubborn, will you raise your hand? <laughs> Okay, so we can agree that that is a source of conflict in many of our lives. Well, let me share with you a story. It was the summer of 1986. Two ships were in the Black Sea off the coast of Russia, and hundreds of passengers died as they were hurled into the icy waters below. News of the disaster was further darkened when an investigation revealed that the cause of the accident wasn't uh, mechanical failure, it wasn't technological problems, it wasn't a radar malfunction, or it wasn't even fog. The cause of the accident was human stubbornness. Each of the captains on those ships, they were aware of the other ship's presence nearby. Both could have easily steered clear. But according to the investigation and the news reports, Neither captain wanted to give way to the other ship. 
each captain was too proud to yield first. And by the time they came to their senses, it was too late, and hundreds of people perished. As long as we have that kind of prideful, stubborn attitude, there can be no resolution or harmony in our relationships. But as soon as one of us is willing to surrender ourselves to take on that attribute of humility and soften our hearts, that is when God can begin to work to resolve conflict. Well, what is humility? Humility is being honest with our weaknesses, our needs, and our failures. It's not assuming that I know it all or that I understand everything by saying it, um, it's, it's being willing to admit that you made a mistake. If I'm humble, I can say, I don't have it all together. I can say, I need your help. But you know, for a lot of people, especially in our day and age, that's something that is very difficult to say. It's very difficult for someone to admit that they have needs or that they're vulnerable. It doesn't come easy. One of the things that scripture tells us, it says, bear one another's burdens. But how can we bear another's burdens if we're too proud to say, I need help, I'm weak, can you come and help me with this? Oftentimes we go through struggles on our own because we're too proud to admit that we have needs. But also another thing that's very difficult for us to admit is to say these words, I was wrong, or I made a mistake. You know, I, I used to uh, uh, get into some type of uh, conflict with my wife, Costco, and uh, after a while would be talking, and then she said, you were wrong. Admit that you were wrong. Apologize to me. And even though I knew that I was wrong, that I was at fault, those words got stuck in my throat. I just couldn't say I was wrong. So we're going to do a little exercise. I'm not sure if those words are in your vocabulary, but can you repeat after me these words? I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I was wrong. Okay, so those words can be part of your vocabulary, okay? But humility is being willing to admit that I was wrong. Proverbs 28, 13 says, He who conceals his sin does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy. Humility, it's so hard for us to say those words, I'm sorry, I was wrong, forgive me. But as we think about the humility of Jesus, what Jesus has done for us, that in Christ we are forgiven, that we pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive one another. It's a big step in helping to resolve conflict in our relationships. But not only that, the fifth attitude is that of mercy. 1 Peter 3.9 says, Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing, because to this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. You know, we hurt each other from time to time. And at times, we can hurt other people deeply. Let me ask you this question. How many of you have ever been hurt by another person? I think that's true with just about all of us. And because all of us have been hurt, sometimes we've been hurt deeply by other people. We need masses of doses of mercy in order to get our lives back on track. When you've been hurt deeply, there's an emotional energy that's stirred up. And when we ha come to that point, we could either seek to take retaliation or seek to resolve the situation. I have uh, the choice either to use the emotional energy for retaliation, sticking the other person real good, or I can use that energy to seek resolution. Retaliation or resolution. But this verse says, pay back a curse with a blessing. And how do you pay back 
a blessing when someone's hurt you, someone's been angry at you, someone says words that have hurt you deeply. How do you give them back a blessing in return? And then, once again, we have to look to the life of Jesus. Jesus, the one who is our model. We need to learn how to be merciful. What was it that Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount? Do you remember? He said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And so here, Peter is probably remembering the words and the example that Jesus set concerning mercy. 1 Peter 2, 21 to 23 says, To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his footsteps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. But when they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. One of the things we have to remember is one day, God will take care of all the hurt and pain that we have gone through. This verse isn't on the, the slide presentation, but it's taken from Romans 12, 19. And Romans 12, 19 says, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And you know, there have been times in my own life when people have said things that have hurt me, caused me problems, and one of the things that I come back is to this passage of scripture where it says that one day God will make everything right. He says, don't take vengeance. He says, leave it for me. I'll take care of it for you. And one day, God is going to bring, bring that slate, and he's going to make it clean. God knows how to judge justly. And again, Peter's probably remembering the life and example of Lord Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount when he said in Matthew 5, 38 to 45, You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if someone wants to sue you, take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. So let me share with you a little definition of mercy. Mercy is giving more kindness than justice demands. Mercy is giving more kindness than justice demands. I have to remember that God's way is different from man's way. Isaiah says, as far as the heavens are above the earth, so far are my ways and your ways above yours. And so God's ways are different than ours. The world's way is what? The world's way is get even, take revenge, retaliate. But in Colossians 3.13, the word of God says, remember, the Lord forgave you, and so you also must forgive others. And that means all the millions of little things and all the really big things. Verse 13.5 also says, love keeps no record of wrongs. You know, some people, they have a, a long record of wrongs. They have a whole closet full of, uh, of things that uh, are, they hold against others. It might be their spouse. It might be their employer. It might be their friends. And they've got them all cataloged and all categorized, and they pull them out at the right moment as soon as you begin to get into an argument. How many of you heard about that situation where the man, there was this man who was talking to his friends, uh, complaining about his wife? And uh, the man said, you know, every time my wife gets angry at me, she gets so historical. And his friend says, you mean hysterical? 
And he says, no, historical. Every time we get into an argument, she brings up every bad thing that I've ever, do ever done. But you see, that's not God's way. If we call ourselves Christians, we have to learn to forgive. We have to learn what it means to offer mercy just as God has given us his mercy and forgiveness in Christ. And then the last attitude that I want to talk about is that of maturity. And we've talked about this over and over again, how the Lord doesn't want us just to grow older when you're older in our faith, but he really wants us to grow up. The Lord wants us to grow spiritually. And what is maturity? The signs of aging are not the same as signs of maturity. You can grow older without growing up. You can go to church. You can serve the Lord. You could attend Sunday school classes. You can go to Bible studies and still not be mature as a believer. So how do you know if you are a mature believer or not? Well, when we went through our study in the book of James, one of the things that James says was a mark of maturity was how we controlled our tongue, to watch our words. And in this morning's passage of scripture, Peter does the same. He says that you can judge a person's maturity by how they manage their tongue. 1 Peter 3.10 and 11 says, For whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceit. He must turn from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. The way to live in peace and harmony with others is to watch our words. And sometimes, even though we want to say things, it, need, it means that we need to learn how to muzzle our mouth and to control our reactions. How many times have you spoken out of frustration and anger and actually made the situation even worse? And oftentimes, it takes a long time to get over those things. How many times have you ever said something and you wish you could take those words back? Well, Proverbs 12, 18 says, Thoughtless words can wound as deeply as any sword, but wisely spoken words can heal. Do you remember that uh, children's nurse nursery rhyme, Sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt? Is that true? How many of you have ever been hurt by something someone has said? And you know, you could break a bone and you could heal maybe six weeks or maybe six months, but some people are still carrying wounds from something someone said to them 30 years before that. And so we need to learn how to handle those emotional hurts, our physical hurts. We have the power in our relationships to either build up or tear down, to delight or destroy, to encourage or discourage. You can either support and compliment and help someone, or you can destroy a relationship by the words that you speak. And so sometimes we just need to come to God when we, we get into those tense moments and say, God, I need your help. Help me control the words. I'm feeling this, but God, will you take control by the power of your Holy Spirit? Help me to muzzle my mouth so I don't say anything that's going to make this situation worse or going to destroy this relationship. And so when you think about it, actually all of these attitudes are marks of maturity. And maturity is when our concerns for others is greater than our concern for ourselves. How do you know when you're really spiritually mature? When your concerns for others is greater than your concern for self. The more selfish we are, the more spiritually immature we are. But the more mature we are, the more unselfish we are. God made us all differently. He made us differently for a pur purpose. No single one of us has a total picture and perspective. And that's because in the body of Christ, we all need one another. God made it that way. And as much as we'd like to think 
that we've got it all figured out, we don't. So God puts different parts of the body, different personalities into the body of Christ to mold us, to challenge us, to help us take on more and more of the character of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Pray that as you go through this week, whatever challenges you face, that the Lord would help you and remind you of these things. Let's pray. Father, maybe the words that I have spoken to him this morning are words that we already know, but Lord, maybe it's just that little reminder that we need. And I pray, Lord, that through the words that I've spoken this morning, through the meditations of my heart, Father, that you would use these words, speak to the hearts of those that are here, and by the power of your Holy Spirit, help us to resolve any conflicts that may be in our lives. For this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.